Uh, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes here for questions or comments for Ray. And, Ray, and for David, to, too, maybe. I want to uh, admit something up front. I used to be afraid of sociologists. It's okay. I used to be afraid of weed scientists. So. <laughs> but getting to know Ray has helped me get over my phobia. It almost makes me want to go back to college and take a sociology course. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Uh. If you have questions or comments for Ray, please make your way to a microphone and identify yourself and let her rip. So I'm Bob Nichols of Cotton Incorporated, and I'm learning from you. Turn it on. Okay. Human technology interaction. It's all it's about, you know. Thank you very much. Do you all hear me? So I would pose this question to you and then make a main point. Has wicked thinking made the problem more wicked? Because you began by giving an example that my dear friend Mike Owen sometimes believes that scientists do not uh, adequately communicate to growers because the growers may know better. You posed the question, you posed two questions. The first was, what did people think was the essence of the problem, David? You may remember a letter that Bill Vinsel and I wrote to you some time ago. 67% of the people in this room 40% of whom are ag chem reps who would be disincentivized to say this, believe the fundamental problem is economic. I do not believe that you used the term economics again in your lecture, but I will. There may be models, they may be complex, but they have drivers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you don't have to pay people to use the most effective and cost efficient system. They will do it with no incentive whatsoever but to save money. And I would suggest that in fact, what we had, particularly with the glyphosate situation, we drove weed control costs in major crops down to about $12 to the acre, okay? A very powerful economic incentive, mm -hmm. a very powerful incentive overall. So that in the end, when we think about solving this problem, one of the things we may very well need to think about is money. And we have a farm program right now that is risk-based. There are many, many, many creative ways that we could use that system and green box it. First, first of all, I, I agree. And when you're talking about economics, I agree with you in large, in large part. And of course, I didn't say economics too much because we have a couple of economists who are coming on. And I don't want to steal their thunder, right? Or worse yet, correct that? No, I'm just joking. Um, but no, clearly the economic incentives are crucial, okay? Um, and all I would add is the degree to which economics incentives matter can also vary, okay? So in the case of uh, the use of glyphosate and how it was spread, clearly the economic incentives were huge but also the development of related technologies was huge, in including seeds, well, you know, corn, soybean, cotton, that could resist the application of glyphosate. So I think back when I was in, you know, I'm in Michigan now, for many years I was in Washington State. Before the development of the seed technology, I knew of a wheat farmer who was using glyphosate in a sustainable ag practice. And what he did was on the back of his tractor, he had four seats, and people with little, literally spray bottles of glyphosate, and he wouldn't do it all the time. He would just do it on certain fields at certain times with certain weeds to try to, as part of a, a set of best management practices. That's a very different use of the technology, okay? But clearly, so the development of the other technologies in association, as well as the economic factors, both influence the use of glyphosate in that example, okay? But yes, I mean, the economics are clearly an important driver and will need to be an important part of this, of this process, I agree. But I liked your first question better. You know, does thinking of it as a wicked problem cause it to become a wicked problem? And um, how many hours do I have? No, I mean, you know, this, this could be a really interesting discussion and even fruitful in some ways but I'll give you the simplistic answer and then you and I can talk more later, and that is, that's where you bring in Buddhism. <laughs> because you're absolutely, it's all about balance. 
And, you know, and that's one of the essential teachings of Buddhist, Buddhism, right? It's, it's not about starving, it's not about overeating, it's about balance, right? It's about, it's, you know, how do you achieve balance? Yes, you have to recognize it's a wicked problem, and then at sometimes you've got to hone in on certain factors. And that's okay, that's, you know, because sometimes those factors matter more. But then you don't want to reify that those are the factors that matter all the time in every case. Right? That's where that reification problem comes in. So uh, you would say, yes, that's a, a potential dilemma. That's a great question. I give you an A for that question. <laughs> More? All right. Now's your chance. I mean, this guy's good. Let's take advantage of him. Good and bad, no. <laughs> Oh, don't be bashful. We're not grading your questions, actually. So, right? No. All right, I got a question for you. Okay. <laughs> um, I go back to the, one of the first slides you had when you were speaking, and uh, it was interesting. I saw it was 4.9% of the people in here were growers. That's actually pretty good compared to the U.S. I am a grower from Central Ohio. My name is John Davis. Um, it was interesting uh, you bring up the point, and one thing I wanted to make before I go on, I'd had the opportunity to be here last year, and uh, I, I can say I've seen a sense of change amongst growers. I also sell seed. I, I work for a company that I have a lot of customers come in. Um, what you have basically talked about so far is um, the decision process of the grower and how do we as an organization, you as an organization, and us as an industry, uh, attack a problem that's so multifaceted and uh, what you're doing is correct you're getting a lot of the word out there because I've seen a great change in the customers that come in to me and ask me questions they are aware of the resistant problem they are trying lots of different things individually on their farms to combat the problem I'll give you an example of mine personally and we've been using cover crops for several years and guess what it does some pretty good weed suppression in some instances. So, I mean, there's a lot of things going on out in the countryside that, uh, I mean, I, th I think as you move forward, you will find it. And I guess that's just one thing I wanted to express. Well, I appreciate and I commend the society and the group and the weed scientists across the country. Uh, they have done a good job getting the information out so far. Uh, I think you will find that they probably, the growers listen more than you probably give them credit for, and they apply what you tell them more than you give them credit for. Uh, so I, I, think, uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, do I have one simple solution? No, but I appreciate all the efforts. Yeah. Well, and I, I'd like to add to that, and this is actually was something I was emphasizing a lot when we were developing the proposal for our research, and I would argue that, you know, based just on what I know, theory, what have you, that there are many farmers out there innovating more than we give them credit for. Okay, that there are a lot, I bet you there's, you, I, you can't convince me that there aren't individuals and groups of farmers out there who are trying innovative things to deal with this issue. And we need to begin to reach out and find out what, what that is. It's got to be that no one is trying to innovate. No, I, that doesn't make sense. All right, so is that on? Is it on? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a scientist who's worked with farmers quite a bit, and I understand that farmers have a significant risk associated with this. And from the scientist's point of view, they really have all of the risk. But I think from a general society point of view, they don't have all of the risk. Um, and you know, the common problem of pollution is everybody's problem, and often the people who gain the most economic benefit from pollution are not suffering any, or they suffer very less little risk from the pollution. So how do we incorporate, you know, the risk that society bears or people off the farm bear in developing a solution to this? Right. Well, of course, and this gets back to the, the first gentleman's point, you know, a lot of the risk is also economic. That's, you know, part of that economic driver. And I won't sp speak to that too much because once again, um, I have my, my colleagues on the committee who are economists who like to talk about externalities. Uh, I mean, I do too, but I don't want to steal their thunder, so I'll let them talk about it. But yeah, this is a key issue. Um, 
in sociology and economics and other, other areas, how do you incorporate those externalities, the cost of those externalities, okay? So maybe it's safer to talk about the non-weed management example, this whole issue of nitrogen, okay? People need nitrogen on the farm, they use nitrogen on the farm, and then there are costs associated, not on their farm, but other economic costs associated off the farm that how do you incorporate that into the whole decision-making process? That's, that's the whole topic of externalities. But I know George loves to talk about externalities, so I'll let him do that later. Are you ready for another question? Or yes, yes, please. Oh, okay. um, one thing that you didn't really talk about, I mean, it could be incorporated in a lot of the factors that you, you brought up is history in the form of infrastructure, in the form of policy, and so on, or what I think sociologists sometimes call the, you know, the consequences can be path dependency. And so I, I wondered, you know, how, you know, you would address this in the context of what you're talking about, the whole history and infrastructure way of thinking, intellectual capital that drives things in a particular direction. Crisis is often a really good motivator to think of things differently, which, you know, I, I think this is motivating this summit. Uh, but you still have that, um, you know, path dependency factor that can drive things in one direction when there might be a collective sense otherwise that another direction might be better. So I wondered if you could address that a little bit. Yeah, well, boy, um, once again in two minutes. Um, I mean, you're right, the history has an important role to play. And the social history and the economic history, if you will, runs parallel to the history of the evolution of weed resistance. And what I mean by that is and we implemented decisions over the past 60 years that created certain structural conditions now that in essence are outside, uh, out of Pandora's box, right? They're, they're out there now. And then how do we deal with the fact that we're now here rather than there? Does that make sense? I mean, it sounds weird when I say it. It makes sense in my brain. So I'll just go back. I, lo I love the picture earlier today that David Shaw s shared about um, hiring people in the fields to go out and scout for weeds, right? And the whole notion of, of scouting for weeds. That's a labor intensive, I mean, in labor intensive practice. And let's face it, the whole history of US agri and global agriculture over the past century or more has been how to replace labor with technology. People have criticized this, people have analyzed this, people have discussed this, but that's been the trend, right? And you go from uh, four row planters to eight row planters to 16 row planters and harvesters and, and there are reasons, there are good reasons for that. There are economic drivers that, that uh, push that development. It's certainly beneficial to certain groups. There are also talk about government influence and policy related to immigration issues, okay? That, but now we're in a situation where we have fewer people living in rural areas, certainly fewer people farming, and now we're gonna say, well, we're gonna have to have, bring people back in to, to scout. That's, that's an economic issue. It's also a social issue, it's a political issue, you know, and you know, we're there now. So then how do we, so there's certainly the effect of that history, but now we have to deal with it, just like we have to deal with the effect of the existence of all these weeds that are resistant to all these modes of action. Uh, we have a question that's come in uh, from the uh, webcast, okay. and this is from Susan Kohler. Uh, what examples do you have in agriculture where local and regional networking were very effective in developing solutions to wicked problems? Yeah, well, I would say that the general, one of the general examples has been the evolution of certain types of sustainable agricultural practices because, and actually, you know, I think what we're in some, you know, I th it's interesting. I think the group has been a little nervous about using that particular terminology. But in a sense, what they're proposing when they say you need to have a suite of best management practices is a kind of a sustainable framework, right? And some of the practices are gonna be you know, new chemicals with new modes of action. Some are gonna be 
some new modern technique for pulling out the weeds and burning it on the field. I don't know, some are going to be more traditional, like scouting for weeds. And, you know, I think where sustainable agriculture in certain areas has done well is where you have this dynamic. You have not only groups of farmers, but farmers working with experts, farmers working with other actors in the system and, and coming up with ideas about how to, you know, develop a set of practices for doing X or Y. Or, you know, maybe some of the water-related issues would, uh, you know, Dave maybe wants to, you have maybe have a good example related to water, I don't know, but water management issues and how different groups have to come together um, uh, to, to address certain kinds of problems. Do you want to add one, Dave, or? Yes, there are some examples of water management uh, associations, and especially in the West and Southwest, coming together where growers have to manage what we call these common pool resources in order to do that effectively. And they find ways to develop rules to share the resource in a way that's equitable, that's efficient, and, and come together. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes resources to do that, but there are some of those examples. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about community-based approaches. Time for one more quick question. Uh, what can be learned from uh, Booker Schultz University of Maryland? What can be learned from other fields that have similar problems, specifically in the terms of sociology? I'm thinking about personalized medicine and cancer treatments, for example. I mean, there you have a lot of actors, you have a, a problem that is really severe, and uh, you have new uh, approaches and technologies now appearing more and more. and. Uh, what can be learned uh, if, you, if you draw parallels from these different fields? Well, yeah, so I, I would say, especially, you know, I, I talked at the beginning, this is just one example, that, uh, the use of the innovation of diffusion model. And it's very interesting how the use, the development of that model in the study of medical practices has been somewhat different than in the study of agricultural practices. And I think one of the differences is, <coughs> In, in the study of medical practices, there's been more openness to the fact that there are lots of key decision makers, okay, rather than saying the key decision maker is just the farmer. And of course, in, in me you talk about cancer, um, you have multiple key decision makers, but you've always really had two central decision makers. One, the doctor, right, who's under a lot of pressure to come up with the solution and who's also under a lot of risk because if they make a mistake, you know, there, there are legal ramifications. Uh, there, are, there are lots of, and not to mention the personal one of, you know, I lost my patient. I mean, this matters to people. And of course, then the perception of the patient themselves who ultimately has to make the final decision, right? That's their final decision, but they're re really relying on this expert. So I think when that model was applied to the study of different types of approaches in, in medicine, it was a little bit different because they recognized earlier on this, this dynamic between multiple decision makers and especially that patient-doctor relationship, which is not quite the same in agriculture, right? Maybe it should be, <laughs> or maybe not, but it's not quite the same. So th I think that's the example that first comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your patience. Um, I'll get it. Okay, Let me, okay we've got a 30 minute break coming up. Please be back in your seats no later than 11.13 so we can start on time at 11.15. Thank you. I just need to find the office.